What's up, Internet? Let's talk freezing pulse totems in 3.11. Um, if you just want the too long, didn't read version of this, all you need to know, basically, is that the build does not really need changes. If you've played this build before, like in Delirium, um, you can build it exactly as you did in Delirium. Uh, the clusters haven't changed. The gear hasn't changed. Uh, the power level hasn't really changed. So... If it's already a known quantity to you, just go ahead and play it again. Um, as far as the details are concerned, ultimately, like I said, what happened is we lost a bunch of power in the passive tree. There was a big rebalance on all the passive tree nodes, and the biggest ones were to critical multiplier and critical chance mostly. But there were a lot of other small tweaks that they didn't mention uh, explicitly. Like, for example, Light of Divinity currently has 4% increased cast speed. In the next patch, it will not have any cast speed, but it has 20% increased spell damage. So we gained 5% spell damage and lost 4% cast speed, which is not a good trade. Mm, Holy Dominion goes from 5% chance to free shock at ignite to 10%, which is a buff technically, but not a very meaningful one. Uh, Purity of Flesh actually got plus 2% increased maximum life, so that'll offer 10%. That's actually pretty nice, um, especially if we wind up needing to pull, you know, a couple of life miners for something. Uh, it'll hurt a little bit less. Arcane Potency lost 5% Critical Strike Multiplier here, so this miner only grants 10% next patch. Mm, Arcane Will gained plus 1 mana per second and lost 1% of max mana as extra maximum energy shield, which is pretty meaningless, all told. Uh, this nimbleness cluster, this node didn't change, but both of these miners lost 5% increased critical strike chance. So we lost 10% crit here. <clears throat> uh, assassination probably got nerfed the most out of everything we were using. This goes down to 25% crit multi and 25% increased critical strike chance. So a 10% loss of multi and 5 spell crit here, which uh, sucks, but I kind of saw that coming. As soon as they said they were touching crit multi, this was the first thing I thought of. Uh, Blood Siphon is going to gain like plus 5 life gained on kill, which is not relevant to us. And Coordination actually loses 2% increased attack speed, but gains 2% increased cast speed. So that'll help offset the loss of the cast speed over here, but not entirely. Uh, the net result of all that stuff is that uh, it's a significant nerf, all told. Mostly just coming from the crit sources, but um, the cast speed definitely hurts a tiny bit too. The other thing that changed, however, is that the Freezing Pulse gem itself is going from 150% to 200% uh, effectiveness of added damage. And what that means is that any sources of flat damage that would get added to the base are going to be multiplied by 2 instead of by 1.5, basically. In practical terms, what this really means is that added cold damage, the support gem, or the awakened version like this one, they're going to get significantly better, which is good because these gems weren't good enough before for Freezing Pulse and some other spells. That's actually what was going on when you saw buffs to things like Fireball, Frostbolt, um, these kind of spells. These spells were actually disadvantaged a little bit in terms of the ratio of, of damage they were gaining from flat damage sources. So it was almost like a correction of sorts. Um, and so now this gem should be offering more of like a appropriate damage multiplier for the opportunity cost of a support gem, which is a good thing. Um, I think Freezing Pulse has needed that for a little while. So if you combine the change to Freezing Pulse, with all these nerfs here in the passive tree, what happens is they almost completely cancel each other out. We're going to be a little bit favored. I think in this exact character's gear, this is like a level 99. This is my Delirium character. Um, when I simulated this, I think I gained something like 2% total damage compared to Delirium with no other changes. So... Honestly, that's actually a pretty good outcome if you looked through the patch notes of 3.11. There were a lot of other builds that didn't fare quite that well. Um, there were a lot of nerfs in the patch notes. Deserved nerfs, I think. Um, but a lot of builds did not go unscathed. 
So coming out basically the same as we went in, it's hard to complain. Especially um, as I think the build was really solid before. Now, there's also some other things happening in 3.11 in the passive tree that will open up path of building to look at here. Which is that on top of some new nodes, some of the timeless keystones, you know, the ones that were granted by like uh, brutal restraint, things like that, they were added directly to the skill tree. For example, the agnostic, uh, glancing blows, eternal youth, and supreme ego. The, the most relevant one to us, in my opinion, is Glancing Blows, because of its location. At the time of this video, as you can see, it's like, maybe like 12 hours or something before Harvest actually starts. This is where they've put Glancing Blows. And I think, frankly, that this is kind of an absurd location for this keystone. This is a very powerful keystone. Um, what it does is it doubles your chance to block, attack, and spell damage. Um, but in exchange, you take half of the damage of a blocked hit. Normally if you block an attack or a spell, you take no damage from it. Uh, and this node is in a strange location in my opinion. For one, it's in range of three different Thread of Hope jewel sockets. Um, particularly this one, which I'm sure you by now maybe have seen the image of floating around. A, a very large Thread of Hope here winds up hitting like Retribution, Precision, Sanctity, Glancing Blows, Tireless, uh, spiritual Command, both of these keystones appear as well. It's pretty nutty. I think it's kind of silly that they put it here. Um, but for us, because a Thread of Hope is a little bit too high of a price for this build just because of how um, tight our jewel sockets are thanks to these two threshold jewels we really want to run, um, it's within normal pathing distance, and that's what's really important here. It's three points opportunity cost to just come down here and take this this keystone. Um, now normally, this this path of building is not geared. Um, I can just show you in game. Like right now, I have twenty five percent chance to block uh, attack damage and eight percent chance to block spell damage. The attack damage block is coming from my series reflection, which is just using its base chance to block, and then the eight percent spell damage block is coming from Mystic Bulwark. This miner here for 2%, and then the Major for 6 So if we took Glancing Blows, we would immediately go up to 50% chance to block attack damage, and 16% chance to block spell damage. The important thing about Glancing Blows is that it's going to multiply any other sources of chance to block we can get access to. And so I think one of the more enticing things to do with this would be to add a Rumi's Concoction, <clears throat> probably here, in place of this Silver Flask. This Flask specifically, um, which we'll get to in a second. Rumi's Concoction is a unique Granite Flask, so immediately we would be gaining, um, you know, 3,000 armor from the base Granite Flask effect. Um, but it also grants up to 20% chance to block attacks and 10% chance to block spells. So during Rumi's effect, assuming we had a perfect rolled one, our base chance to block would normally be 45%, and then our base chance to block spell damage would be 16 So Glancing Blows would take that to 90 and 36. Now 90 is over the block cap, so it would be pushing us back down to 75. But this is going from 8% to 36% chance to block spells and 25 to 75% chance to block attacks is a pretty massive change and makes it worth uh, taking half damage from these blocked hits, right? Especially when we have, you know, a Pandemonious, which is going to give them blind, so they're going to be hitting us a lot less anyways. Mm. It's, it's going to be a little bit difficult to fit these three points in as low as they are. But the reason that we were taking the Rumi's in place of Silver is because one of the other changes they did was to the totem medium cluster, the Sleepless Sentries notable, um, used to be specifically for Ballistas, but now it's a generic like totem node that can be used by Spell Totem. And what it does is it basically grants you Onslaught if you've summoned a totem recently, which means we could have permanent uptime on Onslaught just for summoning totems in the first place. And so 
<clears throat> being able to get Onslaught back that easily from a, from a medium cluster like this, at least at the high end of gearing, I think makes this pretty enticing. Um, it won't be fun losing this curse cluster, but we have the ability to get unnerved back into the build. For example, on gloves, we can uh, use the hunter influence gloves to get chance to unnerve on hit. And that's actually something you can force craft um, at the bench because the hunter modifier that does that is a prefix and it's the only caster prefix in the hunter pool for gloves. So if you take a glove that has two prefixes and two suffixes, you can craft cannot roll attack modifiers on the glove. It's the only thing left is a prefix and it can't roll attack modifiers. So then if you hunt or slam the glove, it has to apply the unnerve on hit to your glove. Now that's not a cheap craft to do when it costs one exalt to block with cannot roll attack modifiers. And then you're going to wind up taking that craft off when you're done. And then you've got to buy the hunter's orb or get it to drop. But, um, you know, hopefully Harvest will make it easier to get sort of an ideal glove with two prefix, two suffix with all the new crafting options. Um, and it makes that more enticing, I think. Getting Glancing Blows and a Rumi's Concoction added on top of our defense sounds like a worthwhile trade for having to pay maybe a little bit more for good gloves um, and losing Culling Strike. You know, we're only losing a 10% Culling Strike. So we'd also be, have the opportunity to pick up a second Totem Notable, right? To help offset that. But Permanent Onslaught, I think, is worthwhile. Um, I guess the other, only other thing we would have to do is probably move our... Whatever immunity you're running on your Silver Flask is going to ha probably have to move to your Quicksilver. So we're going to lose the Adrenaline there. But uh, the amount of defense picked up there is probably worth worth considering this at least. Now it is, like I said, three points. Which means uh, you're going to be shedding something to pick this up. Like, this example, POB, we still have Sanctum of Thought. I feel like, you know, once you're in a... Uh, at Theory's Reflection, we can get these four points back. Only one of them has to go into Pain Attunement. And we're probably still running clusters in the Kigazara setup anyway at this point. So it's kind of a clean trade. But earlier on, it's going to slow your progression, for example, uh, into your crit or into your clusters. Like you might have to wait three levels to finish your small cluster. Something like that. Um, still worthwhile, I think. I'm going to play with this, and I want to see how it feels in practice, especially in, like, Delirium maps, if I really feel uh, an improvement in survivability for this investment. But the opportunity cost seems pretty reasonable to do this, specifically you know, specifically because of, I think, the being able to get our Onslaught back um, when we give up our Silver. The other big change that I know a lot of people have been asking me about is the Agnostic, which uh, I'll just say that to me this feels like a trap, at least for the build as I as I play it. Right? Um, so this the first thing this does is it prevents you from having energy en uh, any energy shield. So currently I think uh, you know this character had almost twelve hundred. Most of that's coming from our. Uh, you know, having an at series reflection with a big ES base. But it is useful. The other thing it does, and the most important thing, is that uh, whenever you are not at full life, you've taken damage for any reason, uh, the agnostic tries to shove up to 20% of your current mana every second into your life pool until you're back to full life. So... The rub here is that with our current mana pool, this character has like less than 3,300 mana. So at this mana pool, we're, we're going to be getting about 650 at max, right? Assuming our mana is full, which I, I don't know how that would be. <laughs> if we've just taken enough damage from a hit to take a chunk of our life, it presumably took a chunk of our mana. So we'll say something like 600 mana per second at the start. That's a lot of mana to lose every second. It's a lot of health to gain, for sure. But it is a lot of mana to think about. Now our natural mana regeneration, um, 
with our four, at least in this character's case. Uh, we can see we've got 389. Uh, let me put my other gloves back on so that I can... Yeah, what do I got? Like 500 mana regen, assuming I'm in combat and I've got Arcane Surge. So I don't have enough mana regen to account for the Agnostics or the Vet full strength. So, taking the Agnostic means you have to address the amount of mana it's going to try and drain into your life pool. Now, the simplest thing to do, and what you're going to see a lot of Agnostic builds do if they don't have just brute strength mana regen, is run a mana flask. The problem is exactly where do you put this mana flask so that it doesn't, that it doesn't suck, right? You could drop your Quicksilver. This is technically reasonable, um, but it's going to hurt your mapping experience quite a lot, I think. Um, I would feel pretty hesitant to trade my Quicksilver for this much life regen. The other thing that is most reasonable, because if this is Rumi's, or if it's Silver, I suppose, you've got a Wise Oak here and a Diamond. The Diamond's not coming off of this build. The Wise Oak is really powerful. So the only other slot is really your Divine Flask. Um, especially when you're in a higher end setup with an Azuri's Reflection and a Coward's Legacy where we're always considered at low life. A Panic Divine Life Flask like this, you know, this is currently giving me 2200 health instantly. So suddenly, the opportunity cost of me dropping my Life Flask for a Mana Flask sucks. Right? This Life Flask could heal me faster than Agnostic ever could. It's limited by charges for sure. But this this feels like a bad trade to me, right? Usually if I need healing, I need a lot of it, and I need it immediately. The kind of hits that are going to drain you to like 60 to 70% health, uh, you can completely ignore with your natural mana regen on the mana side. And we have enough life regen that a few seconds away from the source of that damage is fine. It's really just, it's more about burst healing. Um... The other problem, which I suppose is more obvious, is the opportunity cost of the points getting here. You, I don't think you could reasonably get both this and Glancing Blows. But the cost of getting down here, whichever way you go, I think you would almost certainly not go this way. I think you would probably go uh, this way. Uh, you want to come past this jewel socket. This is six points of travel one point for the jewel socket, which I can't imagine you'd want to ignore, and then one point for the agnostic. Eight points in this tree right now is unreasonable. They're either coming out of the shadow area, which is terrible. Even with a nerfed assassination, or they're coming out of our cluster jewels. Which are stressed as it is. Um, I just don't see a way where this does not cost me at least 15% of my total damage. Something absurd. To where I'm only going to get to actually enjoy a significant net positive in my life regen if I give up my Quicksilver. Something some of you might feel more comfortable doing, but to me that just seems, it seems like a non-starter. Not only am I going to give up my movement speed, I'm going to give up a huge chunk of my damage too. I'm going to be hurting my bossing and my mapping. That's, uh, I'm going to need more life regen if I do that, because I'm going to be taking more damage inevitably from things that would have otherwise been dead, but might live. It feels like a trap. So currently, I would say the Agnostic is probably not something I plan to add to the build. Glancing Blows has a much higher chance of being something that I start recommending in this build. Um, but it's something I do want to feel out. I'm going to be testing this um, pretty early into the league, hopefully. Pretty much as soon as I can get my hands on a Rumi's and maybe a, a medium cluster with Sleepless Sentries. I think the only other thing I wanted to talk about um, was what I had in this glove slot. So I've been leveling uh, these characters pretty differently. And I've already updated the forum guide as of this video. So if you've seen that already, you know that I've done a big pass on the leveling tip section where I recommend leveling with a particular Holy Flame totem and Wave of Conviction totem setup. And this is just because in the early game, trying to set up a spell totem is pretty painful, right? Spell totem support is not fun when it actually takes up a gem socket, right? 
That's pretty much why all of my spell totem builds are soul mantle builds, because I don't have to do that. And this hurts a lot more in the early game. So, Holy Flame Totem sidesteps that. And I also run a Wave of Conviction totem setup in that build that I'm basically going to try messing with on the Freezing Pulse totem side. So normally I would cast Frost Bomb, uh, which is our exposure tool, manually. It doesn't do any damage because of Ancestral Bond, but it does apply the cold exposure to anything that's in this little pulse field. Like every time that pulse is out, it applies a five second exposure. We also have this currently linked to increased duration, uh, spell cascade, and increased area. Give it a much wider area of effect. It increases the duration, not just that they're out, but the duration of the debuff. So what I've been playing with is essentially converting Frostbomb into a totem. And typically the problem with converting a cooldown spell into a totem is that the totem placement also gains a cooldown. Because they don't want you to just spam the totem and get around some portion of the cooldown that way. So we'd be running spell totem and multiple totem support. Because we don't want the utility totem to actually eat up two of our totem slots. We want to still be able to drop four freezing pulse totems. Um, and this is important because these two totems we put down on top of our freezing pulses are going to be affected by our ascendancy, right? We're going to get 6% more damage because we get 3% more damage per summon totem. We would get 1% more mana regen per second and 2% life regen per second from the addition of these extra two totems. And we would link that to second wind because if we don't, we can only put down one totem at a time. Even though it's linked to multiple totems, um, the totem itself becomes a cooldown. So there's no way for multiple totems to work. We actually need two charges of the totem, which is what second wind grants, because the totem cast itself is not instant. So this also gives a bunch of increased cooldown recovery, which is great. So basically the idea would be very similar to playing Holy Flame Totem with Wave of Conviction Totem. And we would just drop this pair of Frost Bomb Totems you know, every once in a while. As you can see, there's a cooldown on this still. It's not that long. Um, and if anything, that kind of prevents you from accidentally overriding some of your uh, freezing pulse totems on accident, right? The bigger downsides to this are that they're totems, which means they're dumb. And they don't have any of the support links we had on this previously, like increased area, increased duration, spell cascade, which means they're going to drop... Uh, I can just run really quick over to, like, uh, Brian King's Reef, maybe. And I'll show you what this looks like. Now, they're going to die almost instantly because these are rank 1 spell totem and multiple totems, I think. I just bought these to uh, make sure I wasn't crazy. So, they drop the single frost bomb, and they're going to use their targeting, right? Not the smartest things in the world. So... That's not going to be too much of an issue on a lot of single target fights where you really do want Frost Bomb and that cold exposure. But there's going to be some cases where you're not going to be all that happy to have totems aiming that for you. Hall of Grandmasters is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, you really want to be able to target Frost Bomb onto, you know, whichever obnoxious Grandmaster you know has a crap load of life regen. Um, and their totems, which means with Grandmasters having, like, insane targeting ability... Um, they can often kill a totem before it summons and activates. Whereas they obviously can't do that, you know, to your hand cast frost bomb. It could also be an issue on cases like uh, Uber Elder, where you're going to have two bosses um, on different parts of the screen, potentially with the addition of a bunch of adds. And even though the adds might be alive, you might really want that cold exposure on Elder. And your totem might not agree. So you would want to, you know, move your totems closer to Elder to fix their targeting, but you won't have complete freedom to do that because of that cooldown. I have a feeling in practice, um, this will probably feel okay, though. And it's something that I'm going to be doing at League Start just to see how I feel about it. Because I think in general, getting this 6% more damage on all four of our Freezing Pulse totems, plus the addition of some free life at Mana Regen that we didn't have access to before, would probably make this worthwhile. Something you can try for yourself. But yeah, 
Uh, that's everything. For the most part, if you, like I said earlier, nothing super big change for this build. We have a couple new build opportunities, which is nice. We didn't really get nerfed compared to everybody else because we got some free damage back in the gem, um, which a lot of people didn't. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to perform great for the Harvest League. It doesn't look like um, there's anything about the Harvest mechanics that wouldn't suit totems perfectly well. If anything, it'll benefit us to be able to set up our totems before we click the thing and summon the monster. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'll put a link to the Path of Building import for 3.11. I went through, I think this is the right POV. Yeah, I went through and I added act by act progression. This is assuming that you are going to be using the leveling guide, basically. So you're going to be leveling with that Holy Flame Totem and Wave of Conviction Totem setup that you switch into Ancestral Bond in like Act 4. If you already know how to level Freezing Pulse Totems or you just have a preferable way to do it, go ahead. Um, ultimately, the level 95 tree is going to look the same. Like, in this one, I obviously have to leave Sanctum of Thought here, not knowing whether you have a reflection or not, but, um, you would make the same basic adjustments of picking up Pain Attunement and whatever you need to do in your clusters to, uh, to get there. And obviously, Glancing Blows is not required. We know it's not, because we've played this build before, but it's definitely an option, and if they leave Glancing Blows here, I think, uh, I think you should consider it. Uh, alright. Let's wrap this up before it gets too long. Um, as far as Holy Flame Totem, I don't think I'm going to update that build for 3.11. Not because um, I think it'll be bad, necessarily. It also didn't change much, like Freezing Pulse Totem. They didn't really seem to do much of anything in particular targeted at Totems. There was, unfortunately, a pretty big nerf to the Circle Rings which Holy Flame Totem really took advantage of. The Circle of Anguish rings basically got cut in half, which means you basically get one ring, even though you have to wear two, um, which is really painful. Holy Flame Totem wasn't in a position where it'd be okay to lose that much damage. Um, it also didn't have the benefit of getting some kind of base gem buff like Freezing Pulse did. So the passive tree changes nerfed it, and then the Circle of Anguish nerf also nerfed it. So I kind of don't want to update that build specifically because I don't want people to think that I uh, would really want to encourage people. This isn't really the league, I think, to play Holy Flame Totems. It is going to be a good league starter still. I mean, as evidenced by the fact that I've basically integrated it into my leveling guide, even for Freezing Pulse Totems. It's a very strong early game skill, even into early mapping and maybe yellow tiers and stuff. But the problem is going to be, I don't want people to play it all the way to end game and really start throwing currency at it and start really feeling the effect of, you know, their money going into a circle of ash basically being half as good as it used to be. So, um, if you really like Holy Flame Totem, you can actually just use a 3.10 guide. Nothing really needs to change. Just like with Freezing Pulse, you might be considering, you know, the three-point jump into Glancing Blows with the exact same considerations and flasks and stuff like I am. But otherwise, uh, I don't think I'm going to do a whole guide update. Maybe in 3.12. I got a feeling that 3.12 is a totem league. But we'll see. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up and get to bed because Harvest is in like 12 hours. And I still got to upload this and try and get to sleep. So I will be streaming a lot, I'm sure, like I do usually at every league start over at Twitch TV slash Wallet TV. So feel free to come by and uh, say hi. Or ask me questions. Or uh, annoy Patrick. That'd be great. Anyway, I'll see you guys tomorrow for Harvest. Peace.